Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of interviews with spiritually awakening people. There have been about 345 of them so far over the past six years. And uh, if you'd like to check out the archives, go to batgap.com and look on under the past interviews menu. Um, this whole show is made possible by the support of appreciative viewers and listeners. So if you feel like, if you appreciate it and feel like supporting it, there's a uh, PayPal button on the right hand side of the, every page on the site. And any amount of support, large or small, is appreciated. It all sort of adds up and uh, enables us to d dedicate a lot of time to this. My guest today is Tom Tom Thompson. Tom is a teacher of conscious living. In 1982, um, he began teaching conscious living, which we'll define in a moment, at the Woodbury Yoga Center in Connecticut. Whereabouts in Connecticut, Tom? Woodbury. Where's Woodbury? Well, it's uh, off of 84. If you're going between Danbury and Waterbury, it's up north, okay. Southbury, like that. Yeah. I used to teach Transcendental Meditation up there in the early 1970s. That's why I was curious. Where, I grew, where were you, in Washington? Or? I grew up in Fairfield, um, but I taught all around Fairfield County and also Danbury and Waterbury and, right. you know, right. that area. <clears throat> taught a lot of kids at the Taft School in, in oh, Wa yeah, yeah. Watertown. Um, okay, and then in 1990, the Awakened Heart Center moved to North Carolina. Um, conscious living is an all-inclusive way of life. It includes the possibility of radical awakening, along with the integration of body, emotions, mind, and spirit, living skillfully and effectively in the world, and being in loving, empowering relationships. In 1964, at the age of 15, Tom became a student of human psychology and a practitioner of the yogic pathways and enlightenment traditions. That's kind of cool. It's a pretty early start, Tom. Um, he's had the great fortune of training in depth with a number of exceptional teachers in both the enlightenment traditions and Western psychology. While pursuing spiritual realization, Tom had many jobs in many different fields. All were important in terms of his personal growth and evolution, but the most important was working 13 years as a mental health worker in psychiatry. <clears throat> Did you work at the, at the Psychiatric Institute in Newtown, Connecticut, by any chance? Uh, no, it was a small general hospital in Derby, actually. Oh, okay. And Griffin Hospital, but it was Yale-affiliated. We had an excellent psych unit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, he has, I, I ask because I actually taught TM up at that hospital, but um, he has extensive training and experience in several different therapeutic modalities, including hypnotherapy, transactional analysis, human potential, energy psychology, and heart math. After many years of intense practice and experiences in several different spiritual traditions, a sudden awakening occurred that led to the spontaneous collapse and falling away of all identification with spiritual and psychological belief systems, traditions, gurus, concepts, and the experience of a separate, unique individual self. Now there is this, as it is, and as it appears to happen. The teachings of conscious living are direct, obvious, and all-inclusive. There is nothing to be believed or accepted as they are self-evident. They point to the incredible gift and mystery of life, living us here and now as we are. Tom lives with his best friend, partner, and wife, Bonnie. I hope the three of them get along, Tom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he also has a daughter, Kelly, uh, son-in-law, Chad, and grandson, Caden. <laughs> so, welcome. She has triple personalities. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Thank you, Rick, for having me on the show. Oh, uh, You're welcome. I um, appreciate you coming on. Um, so I don't always read people's bio like that, that they send in, but I, th I just felt like doing it this time, and it's a kind of a nice summary of, of your whole thing. But obviously we could, you know, do with some elaboration. So, um, you know, maybe we could start at the age of 15, if you think that's appropriate. Like, um, you know, that's a pretty young age to, to get serious about, you know, human psychology and yogic pathways and enlightenment traditions and all that. Um, so, uh, what was the impetus for that? What what lit that light, that fire within you? Uh, I was actually very interested in discovering what life was. And as a kid, I had a laboratory <laughs> and had all sorts of plants, mm -hmm. had good friendships with many scientists who were some of the kindest, nicest, most helpful people I've ever met. Mm. And uh, I was doing research on plant cancer. I had a little paper route. Plant cancer? 
Yeah, Agrobacterium tumefaciens. It's caused by bacteria. Mm -hmm. So you can grow sunflower plants and then you can inject this in there. And in a way, what cancer is, is life gone wild. Yeah. Instead of cooperating, it's taking all the nutrients, everything for itself. Mm -hmm. But it is a big form of life, so it was easy to study and all of that. So I was very interested in growing plants, bacteria. Uh, down the street was a Dr. Hurst, who was a virologist who really uh, got me interested in viruses because are they alive or are they dead? And why can they take dead cells and make them alive again? All of these things are just incredible. So I was looking for the key. I was looking for the key. And one summer when I was 15, uh, we were going on a college tour looking for colleges for my brother. And we came down south to visit my aunt and uncle who lived in Lumberton, North Carolina. And when I was staying there, I went into their library and they had a book on yoga. And, you know, I'd heard of it, but I had no idea what it really was. So I read it. And the way it was presented is yoga was like an inner science. And talking about the Kundalini, you know, here's the key. This is it. And so I went out to the swimming pool and started doing the postures, the breathing, you know, focusing on the third eye, om, 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 you know, the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and was, was really excited. And so when I returned home, uh, we lived in Westchester County, which isn't that far from where you were. Uh, whenever I could, I'd go into New York City and get more books and read. And, you know, there was Serpent Power. There was, uh, I can't remember exactly when it came out, but Gopi Krishna's book on Kundalini. So I felt that was the key. Were you having Kundalini experiences or just you wanted to learn that aspect of it? At that point, if I was, I wasn't aware of it. Okay. I, so I can't say I was, but later on, definitely had them. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can talk about that. Um, well, I'm, I'm really impressed that you were such a serious student at that age. I was, I was somewhat envious, actually. <laughs> um, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. I mean, you know, people go, are you a child prodigy? The answer is no. I mean, I really didn't understand 90% of what I was reading and studying, but I was just fascinated by it. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, and so take us from there. I mean, at 15, you're reading all these books. Uh, did you, how long did it take you to find some teacher you wanted to study with? Um, I was working most of the time after school and stuff, but a friend named Frank Cellini told me he saw this big book on yoga in a natural food store in White Plains. And he told me all about it. And I gave him the money it was like 20 bucks or something, which is a fortune that, to get it for me. And he went and got it for me. It was Swami Vishnu Devananda's book, the complete illustrated book of yoga. And it just blew me away because that's where it got, you know, into uh, a lot more depth. So uh, fortunately, a few years later when I was in college, I was able to go to Valmoran, Quebec, and take the teacher's training course with Swami Vishnu. And that's with Shivananda, you know, Shivananda had written a book on Kundalini. And Vishnu presented all, all the yogic pathways, not just Hatha Yoga, but, but all of them. And that, you know, the com complete human being. And that, that really fascinated. We were not just focusing on one aspect, but the uh, evolution of the, yeah, yeah, the whole integral being. Yeah. So... Um you became a yoga teacher and then did you actually begin teaching it i taught it whenever i could but mm -hmm. i had a you know i had a um uh, after college i had a little problem with the draft board oh yeah and uh became a conscientious objector mm -hmm. and went to california to do the alternate service and at one point out there we ended up in a commune in the mountains and taught it we had a uh, energy weekends which is where we taught Things like Hatha Yoga, Martial Arts, Qigong, mm -hmm. all of that. And then we had Outlaw Weekends where we tried to liberate people's consciousness from the man. You know? <laughs> what, what, was the, what was that first word? Outlaw Weekends? 
Outlaw. Outlaw weekends. Okay. Yeah, yeah. outlaw. Huh. Did you manage to bypass the drug phase? Oh no. No. Uh, so so after I found out about yoga, at fifteen, mm -hmm. uh, Timothy Leary. You know, I was in a. Uh, well, we heard the LSD instant enlightenment. Right. So it's like, why not? So no, I didn't bypass it. Yeah. <laughs> I was just writing somebody shortly before we connected. We were talking about the movie Two Thousand and One. Space Odyssey, right? Yeah, yeah. And I saw that with some friends, very, very high on LSD. It was great. <laughs> you, maybe you had a better understanding of the ending than I did then. <laughs> having I totally the, understood it that night. Yeah, right. It was great. <clears throat> um, okay. And uh, I, maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but I, I gathered from reading some of the stuff on your website that um, you ended up with... Uh, Swami moved to Nanda for a while. Yeah. yeah. So. Am I uh, jumping ahead or is that like the next significant thing here? Well, I studied with a lot of teachers before him. Yeah. But I was definitely looking for somebody. You know, I bought, at that point, I bought Gopi Krishna's idea that Kundalini is the underlying cause of all good things, you know, mm -hmm. science, arts, philosophy, uh, that it's the evolutionary power in man. Which channels itself in all those different ways. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's just the blossoming of human potential. Right. So I was looking for a teacher, you know, I was doing the practices that I learned at Swami Vishnu's and stuff very sincerely, but I was really looking for somebody who knew about it. And so when I found out about Muktananda, I went to see him. Uh, 1976 is when I first met him. Up in South Fallsburg? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I have no use personally. I'm not in any way judging it. I'm just saying my personal thing is I'm not interested in the cultural affectations. You know, so it was a, a complete circus around Baba. Right. But whatever he was was extraordinary. I mean, it was just, you know, just being in his presence, you would go into these incredible states. And it wasn't just the states. You'd actually see things. You'd actually know things. So I, I spent as much time with him as possible, and I, I went through stuff I wouldn't have gone through if it wasn't for him. Yeah. And um, I don't regret any of it. I was there that summer, too, but I was in the TM facility right next door, and sometimes... Yeah, we bought you guys up there. Right, you, you ended up buying it. Sometimes <laughs> Baba would walk, walk down the street taking a walk, right. and right. Um, I never met well, him I personally. I may have seen you there. You may nope. have, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we're you guys were down there, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, obviously, you eventually left that, but you had all sorts of profound experiences. Um, probably, hopefully, no regrets. One of the things that happened was um, when Baba went back to India, I was having very powerful, disorienting experiences. And I had a wife, I had a baby, I had a job. And it was getting harder to function. Mm. And um, very disorienting. So I was writing Lee Sinella, and he was writing back and forth. He's, he was a doctor, an ophthalmologist, and a psychiatrist who founded the Kundalini Clinic. Oh. And he was very, in the San Francisco, he was very kind because he'd actually write me back. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I very narcissistically, I didn't realize he probably had thousands of people writing him, but, mm. but he did write back. And at one point he sent a flyer about Sri Dhyan Yogi Madhu Sudhandas, who was also a Kundalini Yogi. And he said, since I couldn't get the Baba, maybe this guru could help me. Mm. So I invited Guruji to, it was actually turned out to be my mother's home. She went off somewhere and he came. And he, he was an extraordinary being. Mm. And so I was also working with him and his successor, Sri Anandima. I think I've heard of her. I hadn't heard of him. Um, so maybe at this juncture, it would be good to talk a little bit about disorienting experiences that can happen during sadhana, you know, during, during spiritual practice or as, as a result of it, because a lot of people go through them, and I don't know if they always readily find the kind of help they might need. So could you elaborate a little bit on that whole phenomenon? 
So over time with Stan Groff, who I think you interviewed, mm -hmm. and Christina and other people, we started the spiritual, they started the spiritual emergency network. Right. So there were a lot of people undergoing these problems. And, and then uh, people like Stan and uh, Lee and a lot of other professionals uh, really tried to set up an organization to help these people. Mm -hmm. I think what happens uh, if you're functioning in society, you know, you have a job, you have relationships, you need a fairly firm persona to function. Yes. You know, you've, you've got to play the game if you're going to function. And when Kundalini gets very strong, it's blowing all that away. And it's very disoriented. In psychiatry, we'd say you're depersonalizing. <laughs> and, and you really lose your orientation, and it's hard to function and um, process what was going on. Fortunately, I was working in psychiatry, so I had a good cover, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody noticed. <laughs> but, uh, but I think uh, we don't realize when we're really opening up spiritually that we're going to lose our reference points. And that's part of the process. And yet, there are people who have made the full transition, uh, and or whatever that may be, um, who function perfectly well and actually can take on all kinds of complex responsibilities and you know manage things. Um, so there's this sort of transitionary period or this kind of no right. man no man's land you have you you have to traverse to get from here to there. I think um, it's like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. Yeah, you You're go the through chrysalis, the mush the stage. Complete mess. Yeah, right. Complete mess. <laughs> and imaginal cells and all that. The, so I guess one interesting question is, to what extent can that transition be uh, made manageable or, you know, can, can be, to what extent can it be handled such that one's whole life doesn't fall apart, which would be a real turnoff to many people considering you know, the spiritual path or are motivated by it. They, they don't want their life to fall apart, and yet they want what the spiritual path promises. Well, I think the direct approach can bypass a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what we're talking about right now, I think the traditional yogic pathways, you're preparing a very strong vehicle, you know, with the devotional the ability to function, you know, karma yoga, mm -hmm. uh, the knowledge, wisdom of what you're doing, the meditation. And so in old times, uh, you develop the vehicle, all dimensions of vehicles, so you can really withstand the full impact of like Shaktipat or Kundalini awakening. And you're also in a supportive community, you know, mm -hmm. like an ashram, like TM, you know, you guys had a supportive community who if you flipped out a little bit, they had it, you know, they, they took care of you in a way. Yeah. And uh, so I don't think society uh, in here, in India, it's much more accepted. But in the United States, you know, you're keeping up appearances is very important. Yeah. Yeah, I was just listening to an Ajashanti recording the other day, and he was saying how, you know, in Zen monasteries, you might get into such a state that they just would have you stop doing spiritual practices altogether and go work in the garden, you know, ho right. hoeing and weeding and doing some kind of physical labor to ground and stabilize yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. And of course, in the ashrams, like Baba's and stuff, they have plenty of physical labor and stuff. Yeah, all kitchen work and all that kind of thing. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting thing, and, and all, we could devote the whole talk just to that, and there have been books written about it and all, but it's, it's, um, I think it's something that needs to be understood better so that people yes. understand what they're getting into. And... Um, and needs to be sort of ho hopefully understood better by uh, psychiatric professionals so that p people aren't treated inappropriately if they do run into some sort of spiritual emergency, as they're called. So one of the things I did when I was in psychiatry was write a paper about the uh, Kundalini crisis mm. and and the DSM-4, I don't know where they are now, but they do have a section of trying to help psychiatrists know the difference between a uh, mystical experience and a psychotic experience. And there are very clear indicators. And people like Bonnie Greenwell and others have written some very good, useful books. Yeah. But I think... Um, Joan Harrigan is another good one. Yeah, yes. All of them are doing a great job. And I think it is 
important in psychiatric training that doctors understand that just because a person doesn't want to work at IBM doesn't mean they're <laughs> psychotic. Yeah. And, and, and if, you know, there is a huge difference between somebody undergoing a mystical experience and somebody having a psychotic break. Yeah. Although, did you find that in, let's say, in Baba's ashram, that sometimes the intensity uh, would be such that people would get kind of psychotic? I mean, it would destabilize people if they didn't have the innate stability already established to handle the kind of energy that they're being exposed to. Yeah. Same thing with psychedelics. I think a lot of people have a predisposition for brain problems, nervous system problems, psychiatric problems, in doing strong practices. For instance, we had a number of TM teachers on our psych unit. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I as, think... As patients, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I think what happened when you get to know them is that there, there was already something that was going to come up. Yeah. And it got triggered by the intense uh, practices. Same thing with psychedelics. So some of us are much luckier. I mean, really just lucky that we didn't get triggered. But I do think intense kundalini, psychedelics, intense Zen practices, if somebody is unbalanced, can trigger that. I remember when asked with Werner Earhart, they finally figured out you needed a, your psychiatrist's permission, your therapist's permission to take us because it really could push people over the edge. Yeah. Marshi used to say that his teacher's motto was safety first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, that, you know, it is kind of a slow and steady wins the race thing in a way. I mean, you know, the, on the one hand, there's this sort of this sort of attitude that zeal and ardency and so on are really going to get you enlightened quickly. But that I think that has to be tempered with sensibility and practicality and carefulness and balance and integration and, you know, all that stuff. Um, because Zen, they talk. Yeah, go ahead. No, you you go. Zen, they talk about cultivating the apple tree, and if you do a good job with that, the apple will fall by itself. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, I mean, this might be. A, so, how do you juxtapose that with the folks who say, "Well, you know, you're already enlightened, and you don't have to do anything." Um, <laughs> well, uh, that's pretty much where I'm at now. <laughs> is it? Yeah. And if you say that, okay, well, that's interesting <laughs> that I should ask because yeah. here, here's a guy who's been in both camps then. Yeah, I think um, we're creating... I have nothing against anything anybody does. Mm -hmm. And I totally support whatever anybody's led to do. But it's here now. It's already here. And, and yes, most people have to go through a process, but the truth is... There's nothing that has to happen first. It's our true nature. It's what's already happening. It's already here. The presence of awareness, free of any form, is here, and it's living us. And in a way, running off seeking, which, which we're compelled to do by the Kundalini, I think what makes us seekers is the spiritual power. But we are conscious now. The intelligence is living us now. It's present now. And if we really are willing to stop and look at what's actually happening now, we see it. Or we don't. And then that's where the next level and the next level come in. But but it is here. This yeah. is it. By definition, you know, with in terms of what it actually is we're talking about, we're talking about sort of the, 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 the reality and... Uh, you know, as the Gita says, the unreal has no being, the real never ceases to be. And people time after t time and time again say that when they awaken, they realize, oh, I've always, this has always been my true nature, you know, how, how could I not have seen it? And so on. That's right. Yeah. But, and unfortunately, because of the seeking, we know how people don't see it. Because of the seeking? Well, we understand. I think that's one of the reasons it's good that people go down the wrong pathways a lot if they're going to awaken because you understand what people's minds are doing, what they're, what they're doing. You, you can listen to them as they describe their experience and then maybe you can ask them a question or something that's helpful for them to stop and look back. Yeah, they may be looking in the wrong direction. 
Right. Um, but, you know, with all of your experience, I mean, this whole idea of you're already enlightened, there's nothing to do and all that stuff, uh, you know, how, how realistic or practical do you think it would be to just walk into a psychiatric hospital or into a prison or into a group of PTSD sufferers or, you know, people who are really, or, or into, I mean, any situation, um, and, and just say that to people and have them actually... Well, I think I'd be very unskillful. <laughs> yeah. See, what I, what I feel is it's all a play of consciousness and everybody's doing exactly what they need to be doing, even Donald Trump. You know, they're all, they're all out there doing their role in the play. As, mm -hmm. as Ramakrishna said when they asked him about evil, he said it's there to thicken the plot. And so everybody is a perfect expression of the absolute exactly the way they are. There's no shoulds. No, you should meditate, you should. Mm -hmm. But if satsang is being offered and people come, that's not the teacher going out there laying their trip on them. Right, they're That's coming to you. people being brought. Mm -hmm. And whatever's bringing them, it's their time. Yeah. I mean, that, it's, it's, they're ready. And if it, they're not, uh, they go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. and, and so it is true that you, you can't go just on the street and say, hey, God dwells within you as you. Right, Luke Nanda's favorite phrase. Yeah, yeah, and it's extremely profound. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if somebody really just sits with that, that should pop them. I, ideally, but, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, Ramana Maharshi was asked about this, and, and he, you know, he, he said, you know, the, the percentage of people who are actually going to pop, he didn't use that word, uh, on basically just hearing that you are that is pretty minuscule. And right. the vast majority of people are going to have to go through various things before they have the readiness for that to really be, a, you know, to hit home if, if they hear it. So there are many upayas, many levels. They all have their value, but it seems to me the best thing is start by telling them the truth. Yeah. And, and if they, if a person doesn't see it, which I didn't, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, for good Lord, um, if they don't see it, then you ask them what's going on, and then you just keep pointing and pointing. And sometimes, you know, they've got to do a lot of stuff. Yeah. I heard that that's how, kind of how Ramana went about it. He would start by telling the truth, and if they didn't get it, then he'd say, okay, well, how about if you meditate? And then, you right. know, and if that didn't work for him, then, okay, well, how about if you do some seva? You know, it's, it's, he'd sort of tailor the prescription to the, the person's, the person he was t talking to in order to give them something that was going to be effective for them. Right, yeah. and devotional paths, all sorts of paths. Yeah, because I mean, the only reason this is a bit of a sticking point for me is that there's all these characters who show up online who you know, are fond of saying that you're already enlightened, you don't need to do anything. And I, pardon me if I'm judgmental, but I, I generally get the sense that they're not actually living the experience that they're describing. It's easy to parrot those words, you know, and to still be a dick. Um, so. Well, I think, I think if there's, okay, that's a very good point. If there's an awakening, it's like, you know, the ocean and wave thing, but sure. I'll just do it. There's my hand. Mm -hmm. This is me. This is you. This is all those people. And before awakening, it's like, we're all separate. There's me. And that. But then awakening, you realize this groundless being that is all of us. Mm -hmm. And so when that's really realized, that's where the heart opens, that's where you see people, what they are, and then you work together, not against each other. Yeah. So I do think, I don't think uh, people, when they wake up, become better people because they're trying to, but I think through the deep seeing, recognize everybody is that ocean being expressed. And so loving kindness and acceptance and all of these things happen spontaneously, not, not because of training or not because you're trying to, but it's just you're, the world seemed different. Yeah, well, that's a good point, too. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I, I did an interview and there was a, a rather well, a very well written uh, comment on YouTube on, under that video by an old friend of mine, actually. And uh, he was arguing the point that um, 
behavior really has nothing to do with realization. That you know, behavior is just sort of an automatic thing that's carried on by the gunas of nature or whatever, and is determined by your conditioning and your background and so on. And you know, you you might be a rather incorrigible person and yet be awakened, or not. But there's really no connection. It's not like awakening is going to move you in the direction of saintliness or something. Um, and I tend to argue the opposite, but what would you say? I'd say that we have all those genetic and environmental conditions. I, I have a guinea pig and I'll talk about him. A real guinea pig, like a pet? No, like, a, like one of my teachers, oh. Wayne Lickerman. Oh, Wayne, yeah. And he argues, like your friend argues, but Wayne's been transformed completely. And I think everybody who knows him or at least knew him. Yeah, he was an alcoholic and so on. And, and a narcissist and mm. a slick business guy and lying and doing all sorts of things. Mm. And I really feel that most people who spend time with Wayne say he's a very loving, caring, honest, supportive person. And I think if somebody knew him 30 years ago and met him today, they'd hardly recognize yeah. the person. So Wayne would say, because he has, that, that enlightenment doesn't transform the being. But so much crap falls away because there's nothing supporting it anymore. Yeah. So in other words, he's wrong. <laughs> I mean, it does yeah. it does transform. Yeah. Yeah. Not on per not because you're sitting around thinking you're going to be a holy person, but because all those things, all the fears and greed and uh, it, what's that all about? It's fear. It's fear based. You yeah. know, it's held in place by not knowing what you are. Right, and by and all sorts saying, of narrow... if I don't get mine, somebody else is going to take it, and all of that. When when it when what's holding that together collapses, it falls away. Yeah, and I really think whether you know Wayne agrees with me or not. I think I think he's a much more kind, loving person. Yeah, and I think there's something to the fact that um, you know throughout all the world's traditions, spiritual traditions. Um, there is, a, you know, saintly behavior is associated with what we might call enlightenment or higher, higher consciousness. You know, I mean, there are there are some examples. I believe Saint Augustine had been a real creep, and uh, Saint Francis right. you know, was was also not such a good guy. And then he kind of went through this huge transformation. And so, and it, it's kind of a cart and the horse issue, but um, right. But certain things just fall away. Yeah. I mean, and then the, what what's going to keep that going? So you still have your personality type. Uh, you know, Wayne's still loud and outrageous and stuff, but he's doing it out of compassion and honesty. Yeah. Somebody else emailed me just this morning, actually, and, and said, you know, with reference to one of my recent interviews, you know, how can a person be so realized and yet not have a very likable personality or something? And you know, my response was there are degrees of realization. And, and if we if we want to, you know, define realization exclusively in terms of falling into sort of the absolute view or, you know, recognizing one's ultimate non-personhood or something, then, then fine. But I think just in terms of what you're saying here, there are all sorts of relative possibilities for further refinement of, you know, the heart and perception and behavior and all that stuff um, t will tend to come along, I think, if, if the self has been realized, hopefully. I mean, we can explore that a little bit more. Is it inevitable or does one need to somehow engage in, you know, compassionate traditional action? Zen, or, uh, hmm. Traditional Zen, you know, I'm talking about Chinese Zen Tang Dynasty and stuff. Mm -hmm. you, you weren't allowed to open your mouth for 10 years. After you After realized. Realize, because it takes time to integrate. To integrate. Yeah. And in Zen they say open mouth already a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, being in the absolute is a half baked state. It's the ghost cave. You know, mm. we, we, you bring that back. You know, it's more tantric where, where this is God too. This is the absolute mm. too. This this is its expression. And, and you bring, you're coming from the heart, you're much more skillful, um, you're much, it's not a you doing it, it's, it's 
it recognizing itself everywhere in everything. Yeah. And even in terms of what we were talking about 10 minutes ago um, with, with Kundalini and all, there's a physiological component to this. And, right. you know, the physiology doesn't trans... And, and it seems to me the physiology is very correlated with behavior and, and all. And, you know, the Vedic tradition, they talk of vasanas and impressions and con basically conditioning of the nervous system. And that doesn't just get wiped clean overnight, I don't think. It, it, it does fall away. It falls away, but it's it's not gonna, you're not going to wake up one morning a radical, totally different person. Generally, it seems to me that in most cases there's going to be some kind of you know gradual falling away. Even after realization, there's going to and maybe it'll accelerate. I, I know that um, what's her name, Peace Pilgrim. She wrote this beautiful little book, and she she talked about how after realization there's this sort of almost like a hockey stick curve, you know, acceleration of of evolution where where in nature has taken over and the individual has gotten out of the way and so then transformation can really begin to you know kick into high gear absolutely and and that's disoriented too especially if you awaken in a very traditional setting mm. and and none of that has value or, or is important anymore yeah i know there are a lot of cases of people who um you know so many things have to ch change in their life and, and, and do change radically af right. after awakening. Um, go ahead, what were you going to say? In, in this area, I, I, I know some people this has actually happened to, but in this area there's a lot of <clears throat> horse riding. Uh, they do all sorts of horse, you know, dressage and all of that. And so what happens is somebody is getting an, I an identity, and again, nothing wrong with this, I'm just talking about certain people I know, they initially were getting an identity from that. So they were trying very hard and they were, you know, doing well and winning ribbons and everything. And there was a huge investment of identity in that. When awakening happened or, or an awakening happened, they no longer needed that identity. This is someone there, specific that you're thinking of? Yeah, a couple, a few people. Who were in the horse riding, yeah. Yeah, and so suddenly their relationship with horses changes. They're no longer competing. They now just ride their horse because they like horses. Yeah. And people are going, what's wrong with you? You used to be so good. And they're like, it's not there anymore. Yeah. Because that identity, you know, it's meaningless. And that's the sort of thing that confuses people around you. Same thing happened with somebody who used to play golf. And I finally told her, because she'd meditate instead of play golf with her friends. And I said, just go play golf with them and meditate later. <laughs> <laughs> they're too confused, you know, they think you're depressed, they think you're, you know, they have all these stories of why she didn't want to play golf anymore. Yeah, and to play devil's advocate, I would say that there's, that it's certainly possible for a person to be awakened and yet, you know, be a professional golfer or ba sure. basketball player or, you know, somebody that's in a relatively competitive field, a stockbroker or something like that. Um, sure. But perhaps it, it depends on... Um, well, I mean, if we reference the Bhagavad Gita, that, uh, there was a war about to be fought, and that's a kind of a competitive thing. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Arjuna had lost all motivation to fight it. And, our, and Krishna said, well, all right, then get established in the self and then fight it. And, right. and then you'll be, you'll be doing it sort of out of, you know, nature will be running the show and it won't be your individuality kind of determining, you know, the so motivation. So Arjuna, yeah, Arjuna was programmed as a warrior. Right. So that was his natural expression. His dharma. Yeah. And so, so even after awakening, he still did his thing. He did, yeah. But the Bhagavad Gita is a very uh, profound and deep teaching. Mm -hmm. Because it really, really gets into all of this we're talking about in incredible depth. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's come back to your story. And, and as we're going along here, at any point, if there's anything that comes to mind that you want to talk about that I'm not asking you, just bring it up and we'll, we'll talk about it. Just feel, feel, feel free to do that. It's like a conversation. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we talked about a lot of your training and the years of intense practice and things that you did. And, um, but then you had, here we go, a sudden awakening occurred that led to the spontaneous collapse and falling away of all identification with spiritual and psychological, etc. I read that in the beginning. So what was this sudden awakening? It was, uh, you know, describe it a little bit. People will find that interesting. I've been to India. This is the 1980s. I've been to India a few times, a mm -hmm. couple times, and 
Um, again, I was deeply involved with a yoga center and all sorts of stuff, but it just stopped being true for me. I mean, I have nothing but love in my heart for my gurus and my fellow disciples and everything, but it was no longer authentic for me. Mm -hmm. It was not it. And so uh, when I came back from India, I can't remember, it was late 80s, I think, I, I suddenly started a course called the Supreme Doctrine of Direct Recognition. What would have happened in my terms, Rick, is what I call cathexis stuff. Oh, yeah. And cathexis is where we take our psychic energy and project it on people or things or ideas. And so it's like somebody you meet a person and uh, they're just a nice Indian person and somebody else is bowing at their feet because they're their guru. Mm -hmm. And so that person's cathecting. Uh, for me, it just stopped. And I saw we're making up most of this stuff where our imaginations are creating almost the entire spiritual path. And I just stopped and that was very disorienting because all you can think about is the stuff you were taught. In other words, that so when, when all of that stops, there's nothing to do in a way to think about. I don't know if I'm making sense. I think you kind of are. Um, let so you're, me, you're just present. You're just here. Yeah. Like we are now. I mean, nothing's happening. I'm talking to you. This mm -hmm. is it. And that's what was happening. And I couldn't get any excitement up about it anymore. So mm -hmm. I felt myself just, with everything, just not invested in it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then what I was teaching, so I was in a community that was guru-oriented. And what I was teaching was sort of going against the guru, mm -hmm. not on purpose, uh, but it just was. And so the students would be with her and it was great. And she is like the most wonderful person I've ever met. Is that Anandi, Anandima? Sri Anandima, right. yeah. She, Anandima, Dalipshi, and Guruji, who I spent you know, a lot of time with, are like, if you want gurus, that's a good place to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never seen them. She's gotten a little angry with me, but rightfully so. Yeah, but uh, but they're pure, you know. They walk the talk. Mm -hmm. They're it. But I started saying, you know, what you and I were talking about direct recognition. It's here. If if God's infinite, and eternal, and blah 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 like that, you as you are are it. So this is causing confusion. Yeah, I eventually left. It should. I mean, you know, again, just to rehash that point briefly. Um, you sh that is true what you just said and theoretically you should be able to say it to a dog and the dog should get enlightened now you might argue well the dog doesn't speak english so he doesn't understand what you're saying but you know if, if and the dog isn't creating a problem either no but um it's not going around thinking i should be a better dog yeah but uh if it's not in tune with the person's experiences, there's a danger that they're just going to mistake an intellectual understanding for realization. That's the only thing that you're going to say that they're going to say, "Yeah, I get that. I have an intuitive feel for that. This is it. I'm done." And, and there are actually teachers yeah. out there who encourage people to sort of proclaim that they're done. Right. So the I d "I'm done" part is the danger. But for, uh, Wayne Lickerman and Francis Lucille both came here to our center. We used to have a center downtown for 20 years, mm -hmm. and we don't have that anymore. But both Wayne and Francis came. And one of the conversations I had with Francis is he said, I hope I'm repeating this, but if you have a clear intellectual understanding, mm -hmm. it's like looking at one of those pictures and you see the surface and somebody says, yeah, but there's something deeper. Mm -hmm. One of those computer-generated things yeah, where you yeah, look at those, it for a while and yeah. yeah then you see something three-dimensional yeah. behind it mm -hmm. now if you didn't have a teacher giving you intellectual information saying you know if you spend some time looking more deeply you're going to see a whole nother dimension so francis convinced me that having a good clear intellectual understanding is actually helpful because you start looking at things differently mm. And it's in that looking at things differently that you might suddenly see. 
So now if you stay just in the intellectual understanding, saying, now I've got this intellectually, I'm, I'm done. Yes, that's, that's a danger, and that's why it's good to have a teacher. But the intellectual understanding used as a tool will help you tremendously. I totally agree. And, um, and as I sometimes say in interviews, not that it really matters that I totally agree, because I'm not some kind of arbiter of truth here. But in terms of my own experience and understanding, intellectual understanding is like, if we have two legs, that's one of them, and the other one is experience, and you can't walk on either leg by itself. Right. You have to have both going along. Right. And, and, and experience, and they can, and just to stretch the metaphor, they can enhance each other. Understanding can clarify experience. Experience, yes. experience can clarify understanding. And there's no harm in pursuing both simultaneously. Right. So, I, so to follow up on that, when I left the center, something had happened to me. And in the traditions I was in, there was really no way to think about it mm -hmm. or to organize it conceptually. Not that that's necessary, but generally if somebody says what happened to you, it's a good idea to say something. So uh, around early 90s, I ran into Gangaji, and it was like somebody speaking my language. I mean, she was able to say what I had experienced, but couldn't mm. put into words. And then she was, you know, I tell people it was like being in a foreign country and suddenly hearing your own language. And so, uh, you know, she was she was very important in the shift. That's great. So, did this um, sudden radical awakening occur with or after Gangaji? No, before her. Oh, before her. Okay. When I was still at the yoga still center. Still at the center. I didn't know. I, I all the words I gave to her came later. Yeah. So you you kind of didn't quite know. You know, something is happening here, but you don't know what it is. <laughs> there, 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 Do you, Mr. Thompson? <laughs> There's nothing happening and nobody thinking about it. Right. <laughs> so it's sort of like, I just, but, but some part of me knew I, it was time to leave for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. It was not, it was not my milieu anymore. That's an interesting point in and of itself. Um, and, it, it, you know, relates to my own experience in moving, leaving the TM movement and I, a lot of other people that I know that, you know, very often after leaving a thing, you experience a big shift. Um, yeah. It's sort of like, in many ways, experiential, intellectual, you're able to kind of step back and there's a kind of a newfound freedom. You can reevaluate all your ingrained assumptions and, and just uh, get out of the box that you had unwittingly gotten ingrained in, you know? That's, that's very well put. Yeah. I agree. Um, which, is not, it's, it's, which is not to say everybody should just leave whatever they're doing, not implying that. Um, no, I think, I think we're guided. I think people are guided to stay in the TM program or stay with the Nandima. That, that's yeah. their home. That's where they... But I think other people have to pay attention that if something's saying, keep going, you've got to keep going. Yeah. I mean, Sometimes, you were very committed for, what, 30 years? Yeah, yeah, 25 at least. Um, Sometimes I use a... a incubator analogy for this. It's like, you know, the eggs are in the incubator and they're getting ready to hatch and they shouldn't leave the incubator because they're not hatched. But if they hatch, they just don't belong in the incubator anymore. It's like they're going to just interfere with the other eggs. They're going to interfere. It's going to thwart their own development at that point as right. chicks. They need to sort of get out and <laughs> get into a right. different... Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with those other eggs staying in the incubator till they hatch. Yeah, yeah. There's no shoulds. Right. And there's nothing, um, we don't mean to sound, I, I wouldn't want to speak to someone and, and it would be, what's the word I'm looking for? Judgmental, condescending, condescending you're right. <laughs> like, oh, you're just, you're no. still in the incubator, I'm hatched. You know, no, it would, no. yeah. I think it's, I think we all have to listen to our hearts. That's why I want to be very clear about Anandima and Dilipshi and Guruji. Uh, that's, the whole thing around them, I totally trust it, mm -hmm. totally love it. It's just not right. Yeah. Me. But, you know, people come to me and say, I want to get Shaktipat, I want this, and I send them to them. Yeah, it's not your thing. Yeah, but if they want Shaktipat, I know those people, I know. I saw Guruji tell her, you know, I was there when Guruji basically said, this is my successor. Mm -hmm. He lived to be 116. He was a real yogi. 116. Yeah, he was born in the 1880s. Oh, that's impressive. And when I first met him, he couldn't speak English. Mm -hmm. He just came to the United States. 
year later, he was speaking English perfectly. He was an extraordinary person. Amazing. Yeah. That's but he was an old, old, you know, he used to say, when's the monsoon season coming? I got there no monsoon season in Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it's more like Mark Twain said about Connecticut. If you don't like the weather here, wait an hour. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, okay. So then here you are at the Conscious Living, teach, your conscious living Center in North Carolina. What is the Conscious Living Center? What do you teach there? Who can go there? What do they do if they go there? Well, we had a center downtown for 20 years and we taught yoga. We taught a whole bunch of classes. We had two meditation programs a week. Um, I want to speak about one of the classes for a minute. Sure. Uh, it was called Healing Words. And it was actually Bonnie's idea. What happened was I was working privately with a lot of cancer patients. Mm. And I couldn't see them enough. In other words, they needed ongoing support. But I was too booked up. I couldn't get them in. So Bonnie said, well, why don't you just start a group? And so we started a group and we would talk about illness and then we'd end the group with group hypnosis. And people love hypnosis. And it's really de-hypnosis. But, but anyway, what happened is different topics would come up like why is the positive attitude increase your chances for getting better? And all sorts of things would happen. And then people would start inviting their friends in the Healing Words group, which was one of the more successful things we do. It would just become any subject, usually psychological, energy psychology. We did a lot of experiments in there that were really neat. And then at the end, we'd all end with everybody lying down and doing positive affirmation hypnosis. But we, but we had the center... We had yoga, meditation, all sorts of classes. Wayne Lickerman came, um, Francis, Francis Lucille. Lucille. Um, um, good group of people, regular, and then I'd, I'd meet with people privately. But we sold that center about five years ago because we were going to move to the mountains. But my brother got sick, mm. and so here we are. Now we work out of our home. Um, I have a little office here where I see people. We, I'm in the meditation room right now where we have a weekly meditation satsang. And so we've, we've condensed, but in our program now, we're focusing mostly on recognizing your true nature. Um, do people have to come to North Carolina to do this? Or is there any kind of remote thing that you offer? We have two people from South Carolina who come on uh, FaceTime on my iPad. I am not a techie. Yeah. I mean, it's an act of God. You and I are talking here now. <laughs> <laughs> and all your support. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, people come here. And people do come from out of state and other places. Okay. So they can just get a local hotel or something and stay and work. Yeah, for it's, for it's every Monday, 7 day 30. But that's, we focus mainly on... Uh, really looking more deeply or whatever anybody can ask questions and that's where we go yeah but it's not like i'm right and have the answers it's more like let's look at this sure so what kind of results they seem to be getting i mean for instance when you met with the cancer patients was there any um statistically significant reduction in in cancer change in in the patient outcomes yeah i don't have i haven't done a study but uh most of the patients are doing traditional medical help. And that's what I do recommend for people with cancer. You don't have enough time to fool around. You really need to put the brakes on. Hypnosis and energy psychology support those treatments. So I have a lot of friends who had cancer, even reoccurrences of cancer 20 years ago, and they're around doing fine. Yeah. And I don't think it's me. I think what we did help. It's a reality tunnel, you know, one reality tunnel, it says, here's your prognosis with cancer. But if you shift that reality tunnel, you have a lot better prognosis. Yeah, I read your article about reality tunnels. Um, and by reality tunnel, you just m mean sort of like perspective, right? Every, every being on the planet is in a slightly different reality tunnel. And many reality tunnels. Yeah, right. For instance, uh, if you 
or astrology. I'm not an astrologer and I'm not interested in astrology, but if you talk to an astrologer, that's a reality tunnel. Sure. They're, they're interpreting what's happening by their reality tunnel and they, for them, it's true. Yeah. I think I heard you use the blind man and the elephant analogy in one of your recordings yeah. and that's everyone, almost everyone's familiar with that. A bunch of blind people experience, feel the elephant and for one it's like a snake, for one it's like a wall, for one it's like a tree trunk and so on, depending right. on which part they feel. And so we all have our little slice of the pie in terms of... Yeah, we're all right and we're all wrong. Yeah. Um, here's a question that just came in from Julian in Nottingham, England. He asked... Oh, I know Julian. You yeah. do? Okay, great. Um, I, think so. I think I know who this is. Cool. Um, recently, something has been reflecting on how my most real, radical, meaningful, and true change in immediate perception understanding is when the heart is awake. Would you agree? that the awake conscious heart is the true key you see capitalized t and k as is perhaps implied by the name of your center the awakened consciousness i'm, I'm going to answer not directly but awakened consciousness is all accepting and all inclusive it has no judgment it has no idea anything should be other than the way it is and that's love. So when the heart awakens, what awakens is the ability to love and accept people just the way they are. It's like a wave. One wave sees another wave and it knows it's as much as ocean as it is. The same ocean. So the heart does awaken. And, 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 and that's a loving connection with all beings. Even the ones the mind may not like. Do you think heart awakening is possibly um, independent of self-realization, that you can have one without the other? Not the way I talk about it. They're, they're synonymous, more or less? Or? Yeah, I think, I think when uh, you recognize your true nature, mm -hmm. which, is, which is simple, you recognize that you, the, the, this is Sailor Bob, but the I am I am is the same I am you are. And that's no, that's recognized. So, so instead of looking at somebody with their conditioning, you're seeing the light coming out of their eyes, that same intelligence, that same consciousness. And that, that really shifts things. It shifts things, but um, I wonder if that recognition could precede the full awakening of the heart, like, you know, one could sort of recognize one's essential nature and this, this seeing all beings in the self and the self and all beings and all that, and yet not yet have uh, had the heart blossom to the full extent it's capable of doing. I think that's a little bit like what we're talking about. I, I don't think it's the heart, I think it's the mind, mm -hmm. but, but I think old conditioning, fears, interpretations temporarily block that full awareness. But they they can fall away and they can fall away without a person even knowing that something's shifted. Hmm. I don't know, am I answering the question? <laughs> yeah, you are. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of, kind of fine-tuning the understanding here of whether they're, whether awakening We've, is sort of uh, an on-off black-white sort of thing, or whether it's in a way uh, the first step, and then there is sequential unfoldment or refinement or clearing away, like you say, of uh, of accumulated stuff, uh, after, which is greatly facilitated by awakening to one's true nature. We are sort of mixing apples with oranges. Mm -hmm. So when awakening, awakening, when awakening happens, that's something that can't be reversed. Right. And then all sorts of stuff on the relative happens after. Okay. For instance, when you realize, and you know, this could get into a big discussion, but when you realize that you're being lived, you're not the author of your life, that you're, you're being lived, I'm talking about the embodied being, mm -hmm. being lived, that um, life is happening through you, that you didn't create yourself, even your ego, 
even your sense of self, that's, that was all created, and this is all happening, and that's fully realized, you don't go around thinking about it, just like you're breathing air right now, you're not thinking about breathing, you're not thinking about air. But if I point it out to you, you know it's happening. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, really, realization is something stops happening. But you don't miss it. You don't go around thinking about it. The idea of a separate self with its own autonomy is gone. That doesn't mean there's not uh, the program, the instrument, the programming, the cognitive center, it's all still here, but none of this was my doing. As Wayne Lickerman would have pointed out, he, I would have done a much better job, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> As, so you say, none of this is my doing. So is there even a my who could have done it? Or is there, no. so there is no my, there is no me, no my. There, there's a cognitive center, which can be self-reflective through memory. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, what's really fascinating is their neurobiologists and neuroscientists were actually got this. It's just fascinating, like uh, Andrew Newberg, uh, Dan Siegel. But the brain, the way that they know this because of their scans, the brain, like, you can be very focused, paying attention and there's no you doing it. There's just a tension happening. Mm -hmm. And then somebody can say, do you like the soccer game you're watching? And the brain starts a memory loop, which gives a sense of an embodied self, but it's an illusion created by the brain. And the brain only does it, well, it does it differently for everybody, but, but it's not happening. Most of us are in an awakened state much of the time because there's no me there. The self-referencing only happens at certain times. And it's the brain doing it. It's, it's an illusion created by the brain. And they've pretty much nailed this down. Uh, Antonio Damasio is a neuro, neuroscientist in Southern California who came up with the term autobiographical self. At least I think he did. And he pretty much describes how the brain creates the idea that there's somebody in here. It's very much like Siri on an iPhone. You know, Siri and I can have a conversation. She knows a lot of things I don't know. And, uh, but there isn't anybody in there. Mm. Like that Joaquin Phoenix movie. Uh, Which saw, one? Oh, there was a movie where he fell in love with the, his, uh, with his, uh, art, his Sorry. iPhone or something. <laughs> Siri. <laughs> uh, um, well, that's an interesting. This I chew on this one a lot with friends, um, and there seem to be two camps. There, there's the camp that you just described, and then there's the camp um, represented by people like Francis Bennett, for instance, who say, "Yeah, you're you're an individual. You're just not only an individual. You know, you are a wave, but you're not only a wave. You're you're primarily ocean, but in in a, there is still a wave. I mean, the fact that you yeah, but the ocean's doing the wave." The ocean's doing the way, but there's still a wave that the ocean is doing. I yeah, think. I agree with that. Yeah, so there, there's still a Tom, a, a Tom, and a Rick, right. and um, so. But some people are more radical about it. They say, no, actually, there's no sense whatsoever of of any personal self. And and then I say something like, all right, well, if you stub your toe, you know, some guy in China doesn't cry out in pain. There's some kind of localized reaction to it. That, that same thing you know, with Siri. Yeah. What about hey Siri. Did she say anything? What is zero divided by zero? Imagine that you have zero cookies and you split them evenly among zero friends. How many cookies does each person get? See, it doesn't make sense. And Cookie Monster is sad that there are no cookies. And you are sad that you have no friends. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. If, you know, I talked to her here and she responded, there's a cause effect. It's, this one has different information than somebody else's, so it has its own personality. The, the, you said personal self, that's fine. Separate self, no. What's the difference? You didn't create your personal self. 
Well, that it, it, whether it, or not we're, that may be irrelevant, uh, that, but what? But is there one? You say you didn't create one, but di there, at times during the day there is. One. There is one. At times, because there it, needs to because be because of the feedback loop. Yeah, like if if uh, you know if your wife comes into the room, if Bonnie comes into the room and says, "Hey, Tom, the house is on fire," then whoa, you know, you turn your head. You don't just sit there. There's some kind of reaction. So does the dog. Maybe if, yeah, okay, if the dog under, yeah, she might say, "Good dog, come get a bone." <laughs> the dog will. Get... But but all of that is the instrument responding. Yeah. And the instrument has a cognitive center, and it has memories to go with that cognitive centers. We now know most of those memories are not accurate because the brain's constantly changing them and embellishing them. But but it, there is a but we didn't create that. Do you believe in reincarnation? <laughs> I don't believe in anything. Well, do, you know, do you believe that the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth? Yeah, scientists have, say people, they've experimented and they determine it is. So, you know, there's a lot of research to indicate that maybe reincarnation is a thing. What do you think of that? When I was in Connecticut, I did some work with Ken Ring, who's written books, or his students and stuff, written books about near-death experiences. I think there's, I would say that's a reality tunnel. Okay, so in other and words, it's a relative definite, reality of some kind. It's a relative reality, and uh, I suspect people who deeply believe in reincarnation probably do. But, so a question for you, Rick, is the whole Sanatana Dharma and Buddhist teachings are to get off the cycle of birth and death. Mm -hmm. So why would anybody want to reincarnate? Well, I think this, that the Buddhist teachings would respond that, you know, they... It's not a question of whether or not they want to, but they will, as long as they unless have they it. wake up. As, yeah, well, unless they wake up, or unless they, well, maybe they'll decide to become a, one of those bodhisattvas and keep coming back for the benefit of all beings or something. Um, but I mean, the the reason I'm, it's a sneaky, it's a trick question. But the reason I asked is, uh, you know, some people just say, well, it couldn't. Uh, Tony Parsons and others say there couldn't be reincarnation because that implies that there is some entity that could reincarnate and there is no entity, you know, there's nobody here. Uh, but I would say that there's a subtle body, you know, there's a subtle, there's the jiva, there's the, there's, there's, we're not just this gross flesh and blood. And that, that subtle thing retains impressions and has an evolutionary traje trajectory and, and goes through various experiences as it moves along the, the evolutionary scale, spiritually speaking. What is evolution? greater and greater capacity to reflect uh, or incorporate or express the divine. So if it's all divine, what's the problem? No, it's not a problem. Didn't say it was a problem. You, how can you express more of the divine? Because, well, it means more energy, more intelligence, more creativity. You were talking about Kundalini in the beginning as uh, the, the sort of the deep impetus to creativity and the creative acts and so on are expression of that. So there, you know, a Mozart expresses more musical creativity than I do, or than, you know, obviously most people do. There, there's been a development there. And, so, and you're assuming it came from other lives. Well, actually, that occurred to me just as I was saying that. Um, it, it may. I mean, it might, that might account for how a genius like that, you know, is found composing things at five years old. Um, in fact, you and I may have had lives in which we were spiritual aspirants, and that might be, that might be account account for why we both, you especially, kind of got interested in this in our teens. Um, you know, there's sort of what does the Gita say? The, there's no effort is lost and no obstacle exists. Um, the, it's, it's almost like putting money in a bank account. And it, well, go ahead. I, I'm talking too much. You, you responded no, to what but, I've said so far. But we also, you and I were very blessed because we came into a zeitgeist where meditation and all of this was available. Yeah, we weren't I born mean, in Tanzania or something. That, right. So, so the chances of you running into TM and me running into all of this and having... Uh, having that possibility, it was happening not just with you and me, but millions of people. Mm -hmm. And so, so to say you or I, it wasn't you and me, it was millions of people. Very similar stories, very similar stories. 
But let me give you my take on, on reincarnation. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I'm asked to do a lot of memorial services. Mm. But this phone has its own intelligence. It has its own programming. Does it have consciousness? Well, not by my definition, but, but Siri may have a different opinion about that. <laughs> <laughs> but in the programming here of Siri, this particular phone, I would call that consciousness, the conscious intelligence that you saw earlier, she responded to me. There's something that responds. But awareness is out here. That a pure awareness is non-local. There's no time, no space. This is created in time and space and has specific programming. It's a specific instrument. That's what, we, from my point of view, we're all instruments mm -hmm. created by Kundalini. Kundalini is the personal creative intelligence. Maharishi used that word. That's a great term. What created us is that creative intelligence. Yes. And that creative intelligence created us all with different capacities. Mm -hmm. And, and it lives us and creates, it creates that sense of a me in here and all of that. The possibility with the subtle bodies and stuff, if somebody's oriented that way, like you said, if you want to be reborn an avatar or something, to be able to keep that energy package with all its samskaras and vasanas, if there's the desire to do that, that is possible. Anything is possible. But when you are free of false identification, there's nothing to hold that together. And so when the body drops, the consciousness that's in the body returns to that ocean of awareness. You may be right. Um, you know, I'm absolutely right. Don't doubt it. Oh, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and, that's, that's just the way I see it. Yeah, and certainly there are spiritual traditions which, which say that. You know, once realization has occurred, that's it. You're off the wheel. You know, no more reincarnation. Um, what's to reincarnate? Pardon? Yeah, what's to reincarnate? That you've, you've sort of gone beyond that necess necessity or possibility. There's no false identity. Right. Um, although it's sometimes puzzling to talk to all these people who are communing with Jesus or Ramana Maharshi shows up in, uh, in their bedroom and talks to them or all that stuff. I'm, I don't know how to explain all that. Uh, well, I worked in psychiatry for 13 years and I'm a hypnotherapist and I've channeled Hanuman and there's all sorts of explanations in the brain for all of that. Could be just a brain thing or it could be that there are you know, sort of like Muktananda, for instance, had a really ardent desire to live in Siddha Loka after he dropped his body. And uh, the guy I interviewed two weeks ago, Nirgun John, said that he himself had had several glimpses of Siddha Loka, and there's these incredible spiritual beings dwelling there, um, presumably, but that's presumably being. Real. Pardon? That's as real as this. <laughs> My wife just wrote down. Irene just wrote down. It's all possibilities. Yeah. Right. She's right. Yeah. Um, Some are possibilities are better than others. Let's get back to the creative intelligence thing for a second. Um, sure, that's a great term. Yeah. Um, you know, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that the universe should just sort of fizzle out and, and, and entropy should become, you know, just take over and everything just sort of, you know, go back to nothingness or dust or something. Um, but there seems to be this um, counter force which you know results in frogs and trees and people and right. all, all these incredibly intricate well-organized structures which uh, reflect consciousness um, much more fully than a pile of rust and <laughs> and you know some would say Maharishi in fact used to say that the, the there's sort of a an evolutionary agenda as it were for creation that uh, the divine wants to sort of uh, play with itself in, in manifest form and, and, you know, experience itself as a living reality. And hence, there is this sort of, um, you know, evolutionary progression that takes place over eons and, and where, you know, stars are formed and stars explode and heavy elements are created and beings eventually evolve and those beings become more and more evolved as and more and more capable of being, you know, more full expressions or fuller expressions of that in creative, creative intelligence out of which they arise. So, I don't know, take it from there. I mean, what do you think of that whole cosmology? 
Well, I, I, you know, I come out of a tantric tradition, so I pretty much agree with that. But what I would say to all of that is that can also be a possibility of incredible suffering if you don't know your true nature. Yeah. So what I think is most important is discovering what you really are. Mm -hmm. Because what we're doing in this creation is we're seeking meaning and purpose from the creation. We're seeking identity. You know, I'm a better, I got a bigger house, I got more money, I'm Donald Trump, whatever it is. We're seeking in it. And that's ultimately frustrating because it's disappearing right in front of us. Mm -hmm. It's creating, but it's also disappearing. You know, everybody's got to buy a new iPhone, all that stuff. If you know your true nature, first, go back, you know, what am I? And that's really not that difficult. Once you know that, again, a lot of things fall away. But then you can enjoy life as it is. You can let that creative power flow through you. Oh, it's let's say talk about hatha yoga. Hatha yoga can be done as a should, or it can be done as an act of ecstasy. Mm -hmm. So two people can be doing the exact same thing, but why they're doing it or what's causing them to do it is totally different. One in a way is causing suffering. The other one's an expression of liberation. So the, the thing about the creative power is we get hypnotized and think we're going to find meaning and fulfillment out there instead of recognizing our true nature. Once we know our true nature, then it's pure play. It's theater. It's go for it. Whatever you want to do. Look yeah. what you're doing. This is great what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Well, I totally agree with everything you just said, and I don't know if it actually contradicts everything I just said. Uh, I no, think I don't think th so. They're I just think... kind of complementary aspects of the same yeah. picture. Yeah, I, I think totally agree that life is an incredible gift and possibility. Yeah. And that's why I'm really excited um, by the neuroscience, because these guys are really trippy when you read them. I mean, you know, I think it's uh, Dan Siegel, He's a medical doctor, a neuroscientist, who says the mind creates the brain. Not the brain creates the mind. The mind creates the brain. That's a pretty trippy thing for a scientist. But he's a meditator, you know, mm. Scott is. Yeah, and I would have to carefully define mind if I were going to agree with him, you know, because... Consciousness problem. Yeah, I don't think the individual mind creates the brain. Uh, um, but now you're getting on my page. We could, yeah, we could get into a whole <laughs> whole thing about that. There's some kind of much more vast intelligence, which right. you know includes all kinds of laws of nature, of you know biological and physical and so on and so forth, that creates everything. Um, well, we know now how we can evolve the brain. You mean neuroplasticity? Yeah, and 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 creating yeah new neural pathways, neuroplasticity, getting it more in harmony with our body and the energy fields around our body. Yeah, here's a, where is it? Deepak Chopra and Rudy Tanzi just wrote this book, uh, Super Genes, re oh. recently, um, which is kind of, you know, well, it's not just about the brain, but there's all sorts of people. I, who's that guy, Rick Hansen, I interviewed, who's into brain sculpting. Uh, they, they talk that way that you can... Um, but anyway, we're getting, we're getting off on a tangent here. Um, I think the reason I brought this all up and the reason I, I got into this little um, you know, debate with you sort of is just that um, I'm much more – maybe it's because my understanding isn't as deep or as clear as it could be, but I, I'm really kind of into all possibilities. And my, as Irene wrote down on, on the notebook here, it's like I really have a hard time saying with any certainty that – this definitely happens or this definitely doesn't happen, whether reincarnation or UFOs or anything else. It's, it's like, uh, do we really know? Absolutely. That just, and it, and it, it, it could seem, I mean, certain experiences we can have, like falling away of the sense of self, can seem co so convincing. But how do we know we're not going to have some other kind of clarity or experience 10 years from now that's going to make us say, wait a minute, there's more than I realized. Right, so that happens, but who's creating that? So let's say I wake up and I say I'm, I'm totally awake, and then three years from now I have a greater experience. Well, if it was me 
creating that, I would have stayed where I was. But there's something else working. It's not my will. It's something else. It's thy living. will. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which, no. which again, is something which else. Which is my will, too. But, but it's, again, the ocean's living the way. Right. So I agree with you and, and Irene that the possibilities are infinite. That's why I use that term reality tunnels. Reality tunnels are infinite. We, we can imagine and manifest almost anything. Yeah. And I think stuff, you know, UFOs for, you know, they, we may be one of their video games, you and me. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to look at them. They think they're real. <laughs> yeah, we may be next year's lunch. <laughs> um, <laughs> there was a Twilight Zone episode about that. They, they came with this book that called, it was called To Serve Man. And, <laughs> and, and everybody thought, oh, great, you know, these great humanitarian beings are coming from outer space. And then at the very, very end of the episode, some guys who had been working on translating it said, came rushing in as people were boarding the spaceship and say, stop, stop, it's a cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. That was a good show. Yeah. Um, See, they play with the possibilities in that all the time. Yeah. Well, you know, there's that sort of don't know mind thing that they say right. in Zen. I and totally agree with that. Yeah, and it's, it's so easy to sort of say, I mean, there's all kinds of things I think I know that I repeat and that I say, but when you really step back and, you know, do, nothing, is, nothing is certain, at least in my experience. There's like, who knows? There are two things I ask people to ask themselves and, and we look at is, what am I? Mm -hmm. And Francis Lucille again said, the fastest way to enlightenment is knowing what you're not. Now, the funny thing about that is ultimately you are all of that. Mm -hmm. But you have to see it and move back. To, after you stop everything, stop identifying with anything, whatever's left. But also the other, so what am I? And, and, you know, find that. And then the other question is, what's life using me for? Mm. But the awe and mystery of life is we really don't know. Yeah. And, you know, Zen, uh, the beginner's mind. Yeah, I love that. And, but those are two great questions to kind of dwell in, you know, um, without expecting adamant certainty but with just sort of a, a, a kind of a reverential respect for... Right. You stand in the question and look out. Yeah. And... Uh, or look in. I love them both, but particularly that one of what's life using me for, that there's a sort of a, a devotional quality to that. You yeah. know, it's like, thy, yeah. thy will be done, how can I serve? You know, that, that kind of a feeling. Right. Yeah. right. And, and when you tune into that, like you have and other people have, their life's wonderful. It's thrilling because yeah. you know from the heart that you're doing what you're meant to do. Yeah, or designed to do. However you want to say it. Yeah, it really is. And and there's a time for everything. I mean, I, I went through a number of years where I was, you know, just I was okay with it, just doing computer work and, and stuff like that, earning a living. But there's always this sense of, having taught meditation for 25 years, there's always this sense of, you know, it would be nice to be doing something a little bit more profound. Uh, you know, something that seems more meaningful in a spiritual sense. Uh, but it was very valuable to go through all those years of doing that and, you know, built a sort of a financial foundation and, and so on. And so I, I don't think a person should feel that if they're just working in some job supporting a family, they're kind of missing the boat, you know, and not not being able to devote themselves overtly full time to spiritual pursuits. I mean, the guy I interviewed that last, is spiritual. It is, yeah. The guy I interviewed yeah, last week, doing. right? This fellow, uh, what's his name, uh, the Treya Thompson, Thompson, Thomas, Thomas. 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 Um, yeah, he and I just became Facebook friends. <laughs> oh, good. I mean, he does this amazing thing where he and his wife take care of crack babies, and he, yeah. and he runs a you know, preschool in Los Angeles, and yet in the midst of all that, he's undergone this profound spiritual awakening. So, right. um, yeah. So you I don't mean, have to be sitting right there, in an ashram or right, anything. Right. He's sitting in real suffering. Yeah. And, and doing something about it. Uh, but that, that really pushes us, I think, more than a lot of things to look more deeply and question what it's all about. Mm. But then you can spontaneously respond like he's doing. Yeah, yeah, it's neat. But look, at, again, you know, your show, if I understand, you were going to do a local TV show. Local radio show with a 10-mile radius, yeah, that was the thought. Yeah, look at what happened to you. <laughs> yeah. 
And it's funny because when that was my intention, I wasn't getting any support for it. You know, the yeah. radio station didn't want to do it, even though the guys at the radio station were meditators and everything. Eh, no, people won't do it. And, and, but it's sort of like the, the bigger the concept became, the more supported it became. Right. So there was like a guidance system. There was. And the blocks, you know, you're, you're, don't go down this way. Here's a block. Yeah. yeah. Which is a fascinating thing in itself. I mean, we were talking about creative intelligence a little while ago. There's, do you have the sense that you're being guided, that there's more, there's a sort of a larger intelligence than is necessarily fully in your conscious cognition that is nudging you this way and that? When I teach, uh, or whatever you want to call it, it's like channeling. Yeah, yeah. And often some people will write me and say, what did you mean when you said that? I have no recollection of saying anything. <laughs> and sometimes I listen, I've listened to recordings and I go, wow, that, that guy's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. But, but it really, it, you know, something it, kicks my in. terminology, well, it's the Kundalini is what mm. I would call it. It's just the word, you know, it's just the term, but I feel it moving. And I think the people who come here know when that's happening more than it's not because it's just, just flooded. Yeah. I know what you mean. It's almost like if you put yourself in the position of being an instrument of the divine, if I can use that terminology, right. then it's it's sort of like the the powers that be or whatever say, hey boys, we've got a live one here. Let's give them some juice, right. you know. <laughs> exactly. And what a way to live our whole lives. Yeah, it's inspiring. No, I agree totally with that. Yeah. And however one f wants to do it. I mean, not everybody should do what you're doing or what I'm doing right. or anything else. Right. It's like we each have our unique expression. And it may be raising crack babies, you know? Right. You're, you're guided. We're guided if we listen If we listen to the energy, to the feelings, it's very clear which way to move. And it's not always clear. So that's, that's one of the things when I said, what's life using you for? Because there are traditional pathways cut out where you can get a job and you get your benefits and you get your retirement and your medical care and so the temptation is to go let's say a secure path for some people mm -hmm. but they get this other urge to do something else but there's no map for that yeah there's no you you can't when i started teaching meditation um, i became a single parent my daughter was around four and i worked at the hospital and i decided i was going to teach meditation so I went to part-time at the hospital, lost all my benefits, lost all my retirement. Mm. The first meditation class I taught, I think I had five students. And the first night I talked about Kundalini. Three dropped out after the first night. And every night I go to sleep and at three in the morning, I wake up in a panic attack. And my mind would say, go back, get your job back, get, your, get everything back go back to the hospital and then in the morning I'd meditate and that power would take over and I realized oh my god <laughs> I'm not going to do it but there was no path yeah you know, there was no like this is how you do it it was nothing it's interesting it's it's funny you, you wish sometimes that there would be more that there would be clearly marked road signs you know like Absolutely. this is it you're on the right path but it's it's much more subtle and intuitive than that Right, and this is going to work out, you know, just yeah. tell me it's going to work out. It's nothing like that. But all you can do is, is be with that inner feeling and go for it. Yeah, I'm reminded of the Bible where Jesus shows up and he says to these fishermen, all right, just drop your nets, you know, come with me, follow me, and they, they do it. And they must have had all kinds of commitments. And Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was a big leap of faith. Right. Yeah. Which is not to say, I mean, there were stories of, um, you know, hippies thinking that the whole society was about to crash and then running up their credit cards and, or, you know, because it doesn't matter, the economy is going to crash. I mean, you have to be sensible. You can sort of, yeah, it takes discrimination to discern between your whims and actual genuine intuition. Right. And that's why the yogic pathways together, you know, the discriminating wisdom of jnana yoga. Right goes with the heartfelt devotion of bhakta and devotion. And it really, it's a, you know, I tend to westernize in my mind, but it's really a credible system of check and balances. Whoops. That's okay. Just banging the table. Oh, I didn't hear, even hear it. Um, 
Yeah, and I'm mean, coming back to the Conscious Living Center here, which you say is, you know, radical awakening along with integration of body, emotions, mind, and spirit, living skillfully and effectively in this world and being in loving and powering relationships. I mean, that, that pretty well covers it. And, right, all you know, inclusive. Yeah, and there are people who would say, you know, there is no universe, there is no self, there is no nothing, you know, just and just wipe all that away. Who cares about relationships? Um, but I... Personally, my preference is for the more all-inclusive approach that you seem to be offering. Because most of us, you know, we're not just sitting in a cave. I mean, there's all kinds of things. Right, and I, and I see, again, everybody's doing exactly what they should. So when I meet with people privately, I have no agenda. Mm -hmm. They present their agenda, and I try to look out of their eyes and see what their life's looking like for them. And then from that you know, we, we hopefully move forward. And, you know, I have all sorts of tools that might be able to help them. Yeah. But I don't have any thought that they should be different than they are. Or, or if they're not interested, a lot of my clients are not in the least interested in what we do here Monday, and they probably don't even know we have a Monday thing. <laughs> so, so when I meet with them, um, it's what's happening with them. Mm-hmm. And I'm not going to be sitting there going, well, all this would be resolved if you just woke up and know your true nature, because they would go, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, so everybody is like, whatever that particular wave is doing, it's still the ocean doing it. And if they've come in here because they're sad their dog died, that's the entire universe doing that. Yeah. And you're not going to say there is no dog, and you know the dog never dies, and yeah, you're not going to give glib little. <laughs> yeah, well, the dog's going to reincarnate and be your mother, or uh, because <laughs> oh, may or may not, I don't know, but but I am going to listen to them and really tune into them. Yeah, that's sweet. There's a saying in India that um, you know when the when the mango tree is ripe, the branches bend down so that the, you know people can just pick the fruit uh, on the on their level, so to speak. So, you know, we, as teachers of any sort, it, it, it's valuable, I think, to meet people uh, where they're at. And, and Right, and that's not a condescending thing. I've heard people say that uh, because, again, where they're at is that's God being there. That's God in that form of the ocean or whatever you want to call it. So whatever their difficulty or problem, it's still, whether they're, you know, an enlightened guru sitting there or somebody who's, sad because their dog died, it's still that same divine being yeah. or whatever. Yep. Light that is one, though the lamps be many. <clears throat> yeah. So um, what haven't we covered, Tom, that, um, you know, half an hour after we hang up, you're going to think, geez, I wish <laughs> we'd talked about that. Um. I really feel it's important. I'm not saying this is where people stop, but I think it's really important that everybody, okay, one of the things I tell everybody who comes here is they're an avatar. Mm -hmm. Everybody is an avatar. An avatar is divine, the div infinite divine born in the form of a human. Mm -hmm. Everybody is that. God dwells so within people, you as you. Hmm? God dwells within you as you, as Muktananda yes. used to say. Yeah. Yes, exactly, that's, that's really it. And whatever the person perceives as their faults, their weaknesses, I'm not good enough, they need to see that, that God dwells within them as them, that that is God moving through them, whatever form it is. Start there. And it's a possibility. You don't have to believe it. It's not a belief unless you've had the experience. It's, it's a place, again, to stand and look out of the possibility that the same divine intelligence is coming through you as Jesus, Buddha, gurus, whatever it is. And if that's so, again, as a question of why don't you know that? How are you stopping yourself from knowing that? And it's because they're fixated on something else. And so the process of, of investigation is releasing those fixations and turning attention back on this incredible thing that's happening. And then most of those problems, not all of them, of course, because life's full of problems, but they, it shifts, it shifts. And I think people, 
you know, then they may have to do sadhana, whatever it is. But do it from the point of view of the truth. That's it. Yeah. I think one thing, this relates to your point about turning inward or versus outward, is a lot of people look at people like, uh, you know, Jesus, Buddha, um, you know, Ramana Maharshi and so on, and they say, wow, those guys were so awesome and I'm just this, you know, chump. Right. Uh, so I couldn't possibly be like them. Um, but from the perspective of, you know, Ramana, for instance, you know, or Buddha looking at that person, he would say, yeah, you, you and I are the same person. We're just, you right. know, the same light shining out through different eyes, so to speak. So, you know, I think it helps. It's, I used to sometimes use the analogy of electricity, like you could have a whole lot of different light bulbs of different wattages, uh, and they, they may shine more or less brightly, but they're all kind of like plugged into the same electrical source, same electrical field, and that's identical for all the bulbs. So it's just a matter of the, the physical structure of the bulb yeah, the, that's going to determine how brightly it shines. Right. And that electricity is that creative intelligence. Right. And, and it's lighting, like you said, it's lighting everybody up. The word enlightenment only has meaning to the unenlightened because mm -hmm. when you're enlightened, what you do is you look out and see all the waves are the same, including you, and we're all ocean waving, whatever. And so it's a meaningless term, yeah. but it's a pointer. It's a pointer. And so it's useful as a pointer, but once that sh shift of perception happens, there's just all these waves and it's infinite ocean. Hmm. So let me ask you this. Um, now that you're a high-tech dude and you've become an expert in Skype and all that stuff, I mean, do you have any, since we'll, <laughs> we'll kind of be wrapping up the interview pretty soon, and usually I, at, towards the end I you know, we we talk about well, what what can somebody do if they happen to you know live in Canada and they want to talk to you? Do you do online consultations, or would you be interested in it, or uh, would you I really just prefer uh, to keep a local clientele? Well, pretty much I do local, but uh, I have worked with people all over the world on Skype and FaceTime. Somebody somebody uh, in India is the one who turned me on to Skype initially. I had he wrote me and said, "Can we Skype?" And I'm like. <laughs> I don't funny. know, is that legal? <laughs> but, uh, so it was a uh, guy in India who was there, and that's how I got introduced to it. So I do do that some, but a lot of the work, I, um, I feel it works better when I actually am with the person. Yeah, yeah. There's a, but it, there is, there's a value to the online thing, too. A lot of people I interview you know, do online consultations. And there's this one woman that I'm going to be interviewing in July, I think, that, um, you know, she wasn't even doing consultations. She was just watching a Muji videos, a whole bunch of them. And, you know, one day she had this radical awakening just watching YouTube videos. So there's, there's something to this online thing, even though it may not be as nice as being right with the person. You know, well, like I said, I have done it, you know, uh, FaceTime and some Skyping with people around. Yeah. Okay, great. So if people, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to do that. Good. And plus, if people want, they could come and visit you in North Carolina. Right. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, so this has been a fun talk. Um, Thank you, Rick. Yeah, we've covered a bunch of things. Um, I, I appreciate that you've been kind of tuning into Bat Gap yourself, I guess, over time. Watch the number of them. Yeah, and I, I just want to say a couple times we've had intensives that made more money than we thought, and we've sent... Bonnie sent you all a couple of checks, and I hope other people are doing that because, you know, I know how easy it is for it to be a one-way street, you know, just turn on bad cap and watch it. But we do, we have tried to support you, and I hope other people do that because I think what you're offering is uh, extremely valuable. Well, thank you very much. I met Jerry, I met your staff, and you guys do an incredible job, and it is just so easy to access and, and yeah, yeah. You and Irene do have to eat and stuff. <laughs> yeah, so we're kind of gross in that way. <laughs> Not breathinarians. <clears throat> All right, thanks. Well, let me make a few little wrap-up points. Um, this has been a lot of fun. Your website is? 
Oh, oh. theawakenheartcenter.com. Theawakenheartcenter.com. And I'll have a page for you on that gap and link to that. And have you written any books? No, you haven't. No. Nope. Um, but if you we do. We have a blog on our website. There's a blog with a bunch of. Most of those things were written in response to people's questions. Yeah, I read some of those. Those are good. Um, so, you know, you can get in touch with Tom through his website. And uh, this interview, as you know, probably is one in an ongoing series. So stay tuned for others. If you'd like to be notified when new ones go up, just uh, there's a mailing list tab on batgap.com and you'll just get an email once a week when we put up a new interview. Um, it also exists as an audio podcast for those who don't feel like sitting in front of their computer for two hours watching something. You can listen while you're commuting or whatever. And there's a tab for that too. You can sign up there. Um, someone brought to our attention this week that it only lists the most recent 300 and the first 34 or 5 aren't listed. And that's because iTunes has a limitation of only listing 300 podcast episodes. Uh, but there are other services. There's something called Stitcher that might list them all. And you can also download any individual audio file uh, by going to the, that particular page on the website and then hitting the little download button on the audio file. So just a little technical thing. So thanks for listening and watching. And thank you again, Tom. Thank you, Rick. Yep. Thank you, Ari. It's a lot of fun, and uh, we'll see you all next week, whoever is listening. Thanks.